for the second panel of the third day of the Social Vision Conference. Um, today is our Social Justice and Spirituality Day, and this panel fits more into the spirituality side of, of that title. Um, we will be uh, exploring, this panel is called, uh, just make sure I said the right, exact right title. Um, it's called Living Hasidism in the Real World, and it's going to be exploring how these ideas that we've been talking about all week can be played out in outside of the traditional Hasidic community. And so we have three really awesome speakers. I'm particularly excited for this panel. Um, and just before we get started, I'll say we have another panel later today at 4.15, um, which is Socio-Mystical Justice and Incarceration, which is also going to be a really awesome panel. Um, and then again, please join us tomorrow uh, for our Education Day and the following Monday to, for our, for our wrap-up day. Great, and so now we'll, I'll hand it over to the, to the first presenter, presenter sorry. Uh, Rachel Wershberger is a lecturer in the Ramat Ghana Academic College and the Schechter Institute for Jewish Studies. She's an anthropologist of contemporary Judaism and new age spirituality. Her book, uh, Jews in the Age of Authenticity, Jewish Spiritual Renewal in Israel was published in 2016 by Peter Lang. Please take it away, Professor Wershberger. Okay, so thank you very much, Jonah, and thank you everyone for inviting me to this wonderful conference. Um, I'll first introduce myself and then the topic of my talk. I apologize for this virtual, terribly awful virtual background, um, but it's 10 p.m. here in Israel, and seriously, you don't want to see what my house looks like after four weeks of the lockdown. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about neo Hasidism. Um, but the perspective I'm going to sh present today is more an anthropology, anthropological than social and sociological than than textual. Um, I'm an anthropologist of religion, and as Jonah said, I'm very interested in transformation of religion and especially of contemporary Judaism. Um, what really attracts me to anthropology is the way we can actually be attentive. To the religious, both religious experiences and practices of, of actual people, social actors in the field. Um, and I'm interested in the way these social actors both uh, produce, encounter, and share sacred experiences. Um, so if we want to understand why people are drawn to religion in general and why are they attracted to, Ju to Judaism or Hasidism in, in particular, um, we need to take note of their feelings, their embodied perceptions, their uncertainties and desires as they move through their lives. So more specifically, I'm interested in the turn to Jewish spirituality, which is taking place um, both in Israel and in North America. And I started thinking about these ideas about 15 years ago when I began studying Jewish renewal communities in Israel, or New Age Judaism, as I sometimes called them. Um, so the members of the communities I studied aspired to renew Jewish life and to spiritualize it by drawing on Jewish mysticism, both Kabbalah and Hasidism, and importantly, by integrating Eastern philosophies and New Age techniques into Jewish practice. One of the recurring themes of the participants, most of which it's important to mention, are young and secular, um, was the search for spiritual experience a direct unmediated subjective experience of the divine. This was attempted either by practicing, practicing meditative techniques or by trying to reach an emotional ecstasy. Unfortunately, both communities fell apart rather quickly only after four or five years after their establishment, which left me with a lot of time to contemplate over what I've seen and try to offer some sociological insights into it. So part of what I'm I was attempting, well, I'm still intent, attempting to do in this project, is not only to try sociologically to understand why I do this, why are these young secular people choose to engage in Jewish mysticism, um, but also why do they engage in this specific way? As I try to trace a different cultural and social context and the historical roots of this endeavor, I soon came to realize that these were not only related to the infiltration of new age spirituality into Israel or the ubiquity of backpacking tourism to the Far East and especially to India, which is very popular in Israel, um, but also to spiritual trends important from North America, American Judaism, namely Jewish renewal and neo-Hasidism. So 
my lecture here today will touch a topic of neo Hasidism, but I will use a term broadly to refer, refer to different trends and movements which are not which are in some way or another inspired by and draw on Hasidism in order to invigorate Judaism and Jewish life. Importantly, they are at the same time, they are not focused on one specific Hasidic stream, but rather draw flexibly on various Hasidic sources. For example, one of the two communities I studied used to hold regular study sessions on the tales of Rabbi Nachman of Breslav, while they in the other, due to the personal inclinations of the rabbi, the Meha Shiloach by Rabbi Yosef Leiner, the Ishbitzer, was a preferred text. Furthermore, neo Hasidic ritualizing embraces some of the characteristics of Hasidic prayer, namely the use of cune and bodily movement in order to reach emotional ecstasy. So for some of you, this might sound very familiar if you are familiar with Jewish renewal, North American Jewish renewal. Um, and Jewish American and American Jewish renewal, North American Jewish renewal is indeed one of the most salient ex examples of neo Hasidism. A Jewish renewal neo Hasidic approach is a central component in its creed, late, led by the late Rabbi Zalman Shechter Shalomi, a former Bada Mishari. A Mishari. Jewish renewal is essentially an attempt to revive, recontextualize, and reform Jewish spiritualist movements that have most recently manifested in Hasidism, but have also roots in pre modern Jewish pietism. As Shaul Magid notes, Jewish renewal is deeply related to American Chabad movement which became during the 60s, the first large scale American Jewish attempt to reach, an unaff reach out to unaffiliated, alienated and spiritually charged Jewish youth. Two figures perhaps, the two figures of which are perhaps the most important to the foundings of Jewish renewal are Rabbi Zalman Shechter Shalomi, um, Jewish renewal acknowledged architect and Rabbi Shlomo Kalibach, the renowned singer, songwriter and translator of Hasidism to countercultural America. Both of them began their religious lives at the forefront of this new Chabad project. The young Rabbi Zaman and the Rabbi Shlomo absorbed the essence of Hasidism as manifested in Chabad and other sects. It's focus on joy, celebration, and integrated Judaism as much needed alternative to the ossified state of American Judaism immediately following the Second World War. Well, Chabad was not the answer for the young seekers, both Rab Shlomo and Rab Zalman reached out to, indeed provide a necessary template for the project. And I think most people, most people who are familiar with the concept of neo Hasidism recognize it with, with Rabbi Karlibach and, uh, and the Jewish renewal. Yet neo Hasidism has not only struck roots among liberal North American Jews and non-observant secular Israelis. In the last 15 years or years or so, it has also found its way to Israeli modern orthodoxy or religious Zionism as they are often known, more often known. For instance, among the notorious Hilltop youth, the acronym Chavakuk is often used to refer to the amalgamation of four different Hasidic tours, Chabad, Breslav, Karlibach, and Kuk. These young people, the Hilltop youth, object to the institutionalized authority of the rabbis and rebel against the what they feel is the hypocrisy, compromise, and lack of spirituality. Instead, they seek personal authenticity and personal emotional and unmediated connection to God. In this form of neo-Hasidism, the universal message of liberal, non-observant neo-Hasidic Hasidism is erased. Instead, ethno-nationalist sentiments are heightened and at time even political violence. Another instance of the penetration of neo-Hasidism into religious Zionism is the popularity of the pilgrimage to Uman, to Rabbi Nachman's gravesite on Rosh Hashanah which is taken every year by tens of thousands of Israelis, except this year, of course, including many who are religious Zionists. There are also several yeshivot whose main curriculum now focuses on Hasidic texts, instead on the traditional Talmud and Alachic study. All this attests to the fact that neo Hasidism has long crossed the threshold of intellectual or philosophical debate, as in the beginning of the century, Boomers and, and other texts, Heschel's own text, and to end the countercultural phenomena, American countercultural phenomena, and have become a social movement which deserves to be reckoned with. So, why is Hasidism become so attractive? What is, what's in it that is so many people find attractive? One possible answer is that Hasidism, with its diverse textual and social layers, provides an ideal model for spiritual revival of Judaism, a timely response to the present religious spiritual crisis. 
Hasidism offers a wide range of theological structure, religious practices, and ethical frameworks that are amenable to interpretation that fits the need of contemporary spiritual seekers. Hasidism underscores psychological ideas that were scattered throughout the Jewish sources, sources from Psalms to Zohar and Oriani Kabbalah, and revealed new platforms for religious devotion. Internalizing religious life, it placed the intention of the heart at the center of Jewish practice by shifting the religious attitude towards human inclinations, the yetzer, by transforming prayer into ecstatic spiritual experience of self-transcendence, and by presenting religious life as an outlet for coping with existential woes. Consequently, Hasidic lore lends itself to contemporary this worldly interpretations that sanctify the body and the emotion. The attention that Hasidism gives to the psychological makeup of the individual and his emotional needs becomes a platform for a Jewish-based self-reflection, becoming almost a form of religious therapy. Or put differently, mysticism turns psychology. For example, according to the synopsis course titled The Secrets of Hasidism that was held in the, one of the communities I studied, and now I quote, the great teacher of Hasidism gave the Jewish people what the great Zen teachers imparted to their students in the East, a simple and profound Torah, precious spiritual tools, great secrets that reveal themselves in seeming, seemingly simple tales, small hints that invite man on an inward bound odyssey to himself, to godliness, and to a listening that unveils the story of his life. But there is more to Hasidism than just psychology and the inward turn. New Hasidic aspiration for a spiritual experience of the divine is founded on a collective experience. Ecstatic prayer services need a group of people. Emotional experience through music needs not only the performer, but also the audience. In other words, the quest for spiritual experience is, has become a collective or becomes a collective quest and in turn creates new communities. To use the renowned French sociologist Emile Durkheim's term, neo Hasidism offers its adherents social effervescence. In the words of the anthropologist Victor Turner, it allows the creation of communities, that feeling of brotherly love and ad hoc ephemeral communities. In our days, day and age, where people, Jews among them, are searching for meaning, identity, and belonging, neo Hasidism offers a Jewish framework, which is both traditional and innovative, one at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rushberger. That was that was beautiful. I'm going to pass it right along uh, to our next presenter, so we can keep the conversation going. Uh, the next presenter is Sam Baron Shonkoff, who's assistant professor of Jewish studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. He's the editor of Martin Buber, his intellectual and scholarly legacy, and the co-editor, along with Ariel Mays, who spoke on Monday. Um, of Hasidism, Writings on Devotion, Community, and the Life and life in the Modern World. Uh, Shonkoff is currently completing a book on embodied theology in Buber's interpretations of Hasidic sources. And on a personal note, he is my advisor at grad school. Uh, please take it away, Sam. Thank you so much, Jonah. Um, this is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, Rachel and Estelle, I, you know, have read both of your writings and it's just, it's awesome to finally get to be in, in a Zoom room with you um, and be in conversation. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So I'll, I'll keep my comments brief and, uh, and thanks to you, Jonah, also for coordinating all of this. I know it's been a lot of work and um, it's a great opportunity for all of us. Um, so, I was interested in looking at Wexler's book on, um, I believe on like the first page or two, he refers to um, Hasidism, uh, of course with Chabad, especially in mind as a counterculture. Um, it's a term he uses repeatedly. Um, and he situates this counterculture, at least in our contemporary scene um, over against um, what he describes according to a sort of Weberian framework as the, uh, the modern disenchantment that, that we're all sitting in. 
um, ways in which capitalism and liberalism, um, industrialization and urbanization and so on, for all of the uh, benefits that we've received from these shifts, they have also kind of desiccated us spiritually, um, communally, culturally, and, 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 um, and personally in a, in a variety of ways. Um, and what's, what, as a scholar primarily of neo-Hasidism, what I find very interesting about this is ways that that narrative of situating counterculture over against this kind of modern alienation and disenchantment um, has really animated neo-Hasidism and basically all of the forms that it's taken um, throughout its relatively brief history. We see it super strongly in the kind of first wave, the European wave, um, the ways in which, uh, for example, Martin Buber um, really identifies the value of Hasidism for so-called the, the modern or Western person um, uh, in, in very similar terms. And then when we look at kind of the American counterculture moment of the 60s and 70s with Salman Schechter and uh, Karl Bach and Art Green and so on, there's a very, again, a very similar narrative that actually remarkably echoes the kind of early 20th century uh, counterculture, we could say, or neo-romanticism of that period um, in the American context. And I'm interested in where we are now with this, because um, when I look at, I just taught a course last semester at the GTU on the American on the Jewish counterculture of the 60s. Um, and as a scholar, primarily of sort of the German Jewish context, a couple generations before that, um, I, I speak about these, these, this sort of uh, motif in the past uh, century plus, if not millennia, um, of, of this kind of particular configuration of, of counterculture. Um, and there's a sense of recognition of this dynamic um, as, as feeling very contemporary, but I'm interested in um, kind of where neo-Hasidism is right now in that scheme. And uh, it's actually, Rachel, like where you just took us to it, the Israeli context and Hilltop Youth and so on. Uh, I, it, this is this complements it perfectly because I'm I'm situated in Berkeley, California, um, a fair distance from the West Bank and so on, and um, so I'm I'm thinking about it especially in this context here, um, and I want to just kind of use in these brief comments this concept of avodah begashmiut of of worship and corporeality as a concept just to anchor some of my thoughts right now. Um, I, I, this is this, this concept which has been at the heart of Hasidism um, really since its beginnings. Um, I see as, as inspiring and, and informative in some way for, for neo-Hasidism today, um, this sense that Avodah, the, the, that the work that we have to do in the world, the activism that we have to do in the world is inseparable from, from spiritual practice, um, I think is a, is a, is a striking um, element to consider here. And doing this in Gashmiut, in corporeality, in the world as we know it, and Rachel, you brought our attention to this before a bit, um, is something that resonates, I think, for like the call of this moment that we're living in right now. Um, this is bound up with what Wexler is describing as a sort of re-enchantment, re-sacralization um, that he sees in, in uh, Schneerson's thought um, and that has to be in, in the uh, neo-Hasidic work of, of today. Um, Going deeper into it though, I wanna just bring out a tension that I see in Avodah Begashmiut. Um, and it's a tension between a kind of uh, posture of awe and gratitude vis-a-vis -vis whatever is happening at any given point, at any given moment, and an activist unsatisfied posture vis-a-vis um, -vis that same reality. And I, I think that's, a, that's, that's an interesting tension that I want to kind of think through a bit um, and, and maybe integrate into our discussion. 
Um, so on one hand, avodah begashmi means that uh, I am I am devoting a kind of spiritual attention without judgment <laughs> to whatever is happening, right? To whatever crazy thoughts are coming up in my mind, to whomever I am engaged with, um, to whatever's happening around me. I am receiving this. I'm, I'm recognizing that, um, that the divine is, is also here, um, that kola aretz, malach kola aretz kavoto, that the divine gravity, you know, saturates everything, the leitza tar panui mine, that there is no place where the divine is absent. Um, and this is a striking, uh, this is a striking mindset, um, but also, seemingly in conflict with this form of attention. Avadab Gashmi reminds us um, that we are also engaging in a process of redeeming what's happening in that moment. There is the ha'ala'a, there's the ha'ala'at nitzotzot, there's the uplifting of the sparks. We are here to engage in this Avadab Gashmi, to engage in this so-called worship or practice in this very world, this bodily world that we're inhabiting. Um, we're also supposed to be identifying places of brokenness, places um, of darkness, places that are in need of repair, in need of healing. And this calls upon us to take action. Um, and something, as, as Wexler points out in his book, that really is kind of a motif throughout the Rebbe's thought is this notion of hamasa huayikar. Um, action is the most important thing. Um, but what does it mean to take action, uh, to uplift and to repair that which we are recognizing as being filled with the divine presence? Um, I, I love this tension. <laughs> um, I, and I, 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 I see ways in which in this contemporary moment of at least um, a particular branch of American neo-Hasidism, um, I see it as uh, as informing a kind of spiritual activism um, that's that's necessary right now. Um, where on one hand we can look upon this world, which is turbulent right now, which is is hurting right now in so many different ways, um, and to still love it, right? To still like approach the other and those we disagree with, and so on with a kind of gratitude that we can even engage in this process right now, that we have, that we have health, that we have bodies, that we have uh, our senses and the elements of the world are accompanying us here in this miraculous opportunity to just look upon what is happening in this world. Um, but also not to stop there, right? This is that Abu Dhabi Gashmi, in in at least in a kind of neo-Hasidic context, is challenging us to actually um, to intervene and to also see the world as not enough, <laughs> to see it in, in need of liberation, in need of redemption. So this is not a call for civility. This is not a call for, um, for everybody just getting along in a kind of kumbaya messianism. This is actually, um, saying that our avodah, like our work, is to engage um, and to transform. But of course, once we start talking about transforming and uplifting and repairing, we are entering a highly culturally specific demand, right? So what is the diagnosis? <laughs> what is the prognosis? And how does my own cultural situatedness, my own sense of values, um, inform that work. And here we recognize, I think, a real um, uh, a stark, um, I don't know, abyss might be too strong of a word, but a, a gap, an interruption between, Hasid between Hasidism and Neo-Hasidism. The places um, of, in need of uplift for Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson and for many uh, people throughout Hasidic history, even through the present day, might not be mine, right? Most of the Hasidic world today is, in, is supporting Trump, 
right? Most of the Hasidic, Hasid, Hasidism itself has profoundly uh, impactful um, histories of misogyny, of ethnocentrism, if not outright racism. This is this is a part of um, that, and the kind of shlichus, the kind of uh, the kinds of missions that that Schneerson was was rallying his his um, his fellow Chabadniks around. The places to intervene in the world to heal the world generally are not the ones that I want to take on. <laughs> like I don't think that a lack of uh, ritual observance among among Jewish men um, is necessarily the place where I want to channel Avodah where I want to where I want to channel um, loving activism and change. So I guess. On some level, like in this contemporary moment in neo hasidism what I see as a real opportunity in growth edge um, is not only to sort of be mindful of, of, this, of this dialectic in Avodah Begashmi vis-a-vis the world, um, but also to direct that kind of gaze at Hasidism itself, um, to draw upon the wells of Hasidic wisdom, Hasidic sources, Hasidic culture with that kind of love and awe and gratitude that defines that kind of one side of, of the tension of, of seeing the divine in all things and recognizing like this tradition is surging with beauty <laughs> and with wisdom. Um, while also identifying places within the Hasidism itself that we might recognize as as broken, as as shadowy, as in as in need of repair, um, and to and it's in that way to actually um, to break in some ways from previous uh, waves of neo Hasidism, which maybe were a little too quick to romanticize Hasidism, sugarcoat Hasidism. Um, I'm finishing this book right now on ways that Buber, right, was, was kind of transforming Hasidic sources, editing them, censoring them at times to make Hasidism uh, a little more appealing and kosher for his cosmopolitan, um, liberal, more diverse audience and so on. And, and what I, this, this dialectic that I want to bring out in Avodah Vagashmiut, I think, is calling upon us to do something a little more nuanced. Um, in, in neo hasidism today. And maybe that's not even neo hasidism anymore. Maybe that's just critical human beings who are, uh, who are engaging with a tradition um, that they see both worthy of spiritual attention and worthy of critical engagement. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Sam. Um, we're gonna move on to our, to our last presenter and then we'll have uh, time to all talk Afterwards, I just want to remind everyone who's on the Zoom that there's a Q&A section down there where you can type some questions that we'll try to address towards the end. Um, and with that, I will introduce our next presenter. Estelle Frankel is a practicing psychotherapist, author, spiritual director, and popular public speaker. In her private practice in Albany, California, she works with individuals and couples providing brief and long-term psychotherapy and spiritual mentoring. Estelle is also a seasoned teacher and author of numerous books on Jewish mysticism and meditation who offers workshops on the intersections of psychology and spirituality, Kabbalah and healing and Musar, mindfulness and positive psychology. Um, with that, please take it away, Estelle. Hear me. Now we can hear you, yeah. Thank you. So um, I've been on a long journey um, I was there at the beginning of the neo-Hasidic movement, 1969, in the height of the San Francisco uh, Haight-Ashbury hippie movement. I somehow wandered into the House of Love and Prayer where Shlomo Karlbach was leading this ecstatic Shabbat service and it kindled a flame in my Jewish soul and propelled me to go on a journey to Israel, where I lived for um, almost 10 years, immersed in the Hasidic world. <clears throat> I did have a crisis of faith 
that brought me back to the States. And like many disillusioned theologians, I began to study psychology. And over the years, I began to integrate what the wisdom and the deep spirituality that I absorbed from my spiritual teachers with the insights from depth psychology. And I continue to do that to this day. Um, I would say that the movement in my life has been back and forth between the particular and the universal. My soul is deeply universal. And the way I hold Torah is that it has to be universally true. I like teaching best when they're non-Jews in the audience or in the classroom so that every word that I speak is true for every human being. So there's not just some ethnocentric um, feel good teaching, but something that actually is universally humanistically true and useful. Schneer Zalman, um, Rabbi Schneerson says that Judaism's gift is this power to re-enchant all of life, to reveal the divinity, the magic, the divine essence at the heart of reality. And so I see my work as a healer, as a therapist, steeped in Jewish thought, and Jewish practice, as working to re-enchant the, the field of psychology. Um, when Freud first um, presented his psychoanalytic theories, he downplayed the Jewish part of that was at the heart of psychoanalysis in order to gain legitimacy in the scientific community. He downplayed the spiritual. Um, there are many ways that psychoanalysis is a Jewish art. It's a transfer of um, hermeneutics from the text, from the word, to the soul. It's the soul as revelatory. The soul is the text. Reb Sadok Cohen of Lublin, one of 19th century great Hasidic masters whom I studied, said that we, the human soul, is the Torah, the real Torah, the real revelation of God's will. And that the text of the Torah is a commentary a commentary there to help us understand the infinite depth that is within us. So when I sit with people, I'm listening to what they're sharing in the same way that I would study a sacred text. I'm looking at the smichut parshiot. Why does this idea come after that idea? What is the connection between everything? What are the shivim panim? What are the infinite depths of meaning and the multiplicity of meanings that emerge um, with every word that a person speaks and with every word that is not spoken, the silences as well. So I'm very much a Jewish therapist and um, Rachel, you mentioned how the Rebbe's were also healers. They weren't just spiritual leaders and teachers. Eastern European Jews were all traumatized from 2000 years of oppression. Not that there wasn't joy also, but there was tremendous suffering and oppression. Depression was rampant and is still plaguing Ashkenazic Jewish uh, minds. It's sort of baked into our wiring to um, 
carry the wounds of history. And so the Rebbe's had to be soul healers. And they had powerful tools for working with their Hasidim. Many of these tools have made their way into my consulting office. I use prayer. I use the art of bracha, of giving a bracha at the end of the session, offering etza, um, seasoned wisdom offerings, and some shamanic ritual. These were all um, practices that the Rebbe's used when counseling their followers. Um, <clears throat> so I want to mention um, three areas where Hasidism um, inspires my work. One has to do with identity. People coming to therapy often are exploring, who am I? What is my purpose? And as we find in um, many um, fables, stories of mistaken identity, at the heart of a lot of psychopathology is a case of mistaken identity. What do I mean by mistaken identity? That we mistake the part for the whole. People identify with their wounds, with their brokenness, rather than their wholeness and their holiness. And so there's a little bit of spiritual chiropractic that goes on in the work I do, where people learn to see themselves through God's eyes, not through the eyes of others who misperceive them, not through critical eyes that focus on the flaw, but this ability to see holistically the soul of the individual, the soul that is pure, that is the chip off the divine block. And just that shift in identity in itself is tremendously healing. You know, people always have a story they tell themselves about their story. And so there's something called story editing. What is story editing? It's changing the voice of the narrator from a critical narrator, from a removed narrator to a sympathetic narrator. It's a concept from literature. Something goes on with holy listening. When you listen with um, a wish to hear and see the sacred, the beauty, the holiness of each individual, that that holy listening imparts to a client the ability to see and hold themselves differently, to see themselves through God's eyes, to see the, their soul as it exists within eternity, within the divine mind, not just in uh, the brokenness that they might be feeling. And so deep in Hasidic thought, there is the idea that our wounds give us our strengths, that where we are broken is where we are gifted. These are all beautiful Hasidic teachings that um, enrich the way a therapist can do therapy. It's a kind of meta-therapy. We're not just working on def healing deficits, but on helping people claim their strengths, their virtues, um, what we call in Musar the Midot, it's also in Hasidus, that um, it's a strength-based uh, approach to healing. So there's also shifting from fate to destiny. Fate is everything that happens to us unbidden. 
the unlucky stuff that befalls us that we don't have a lot of choice about. Destiny, on the other hand, is heeding the call of the divine. What we can make out of our fate creates our destiny. And it's the soul attuned to the divine call that enables us to hear and follow our destiny. So when people ask me, what kind of Jew are you, Estelle? I like to say that I used to be Orthodox and now I'm Paradox. And this brings me to the second area um, where my work is informed by Hasidic thought. God is the union of opposites in Chabad Hasidus. Wholeness, shleimut, is the union of opposites. If you look at the word shalem, shalom, it's the esh of the shin and the mem of the maim, of the water, that when fire and water, when these opposites cohere, there's shalom and shleimut, there's wholeness and inner peace. We are all multiples. <laughs> Multiples live in us. We have multiple tendencies, light and dark, introversion, extroversion, uh, generosity, stinginess. We, we have many impulses and many self states, as it's called in the field of psychoanalysis or in internal family systems, many parts of the self that have, you know, personalities. And wholeness and healing come about when all the parts can come together under a single talit and say amen together. So I want to say that um, one of the deep gifts of Hasidut to the field of psychology is this power of paradox of bringing and uniting opposites to create wholeness. And I do think that this has bearing on our larger society. Americans are notoriously simplistic in their thinking that truth is this or that, rather than seeing truth as the union of opposite perspectives. So I'll, I'll pause here and save for the conversation. Thank you so much, Estelle. That was that was beautiful. The taking of the shalom and the shin and the mem. That was, I'm still thinking about that. So thank you for that. Um, I'm now just going to open it up to to all the presenters, and we can go into into gallery mode to to see everyone. Um, if you want to respond to anything anyone else said before we open it up to to, to more questions, um, please feel free to to jump in and, and respond to each other's each other's remarks. Sam, I really appreciated uh, your willingness to go out on the limb and, and criticize uh, or sort of talk about the dark side of Hasidism, not just to romanticize it. I've certainly um, been in and out of the garbage pail with, uh, with all of that. Appreciate that, Estelle, and I, I, I uh, really appreciated you also, like nonetheless inhabiting Hasidic wisdom, even having gone through those experiences. And that's like, that's uh, I think exemplifying um, that kind of tension that that I feel like is really rich and 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 uh, potentially nourishing for neo Hasidism today is to have that that kind of realism. Um, and critical eye while also uh, while also remaining receptive <laughs> to to the sources. Yeah, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater, which many people I know did once they left that world. 
but it's just too rich and beautiful and um, but it does it does need to, we need to sift through and uh, not be afraid to name the misogyny and uh, racism and you know when I read Hasidic texts I literally you know, I kind of have to like oh, okay I'll find one page per Parsha I can kind of go really deep with and a lot of it I can't I can't stomach. Yeah, and that's been a trope throughout the history of neo-Hasidism. A lot of the research that I've done for this uh, this book I'm working on is looking through Buber's own like unpublished notebook where he and you see him like you know turning to any particular Hasidic book collection and in his notes it's like oh this one on page three oh this one on page twenty four oh this one on page you know it's like <laughs> Wow, you're you're skipping a lot in 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 writing things down for your anthology, and it's partly yeah. I mean, I I, I think there's there's a good dynamic. There's 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 a fruitful dynamic, I think, among the three of us. Because also with what you're bringing in, Rachel, around you know, I think it's tempting to identify like at least in recent generations, like Hasidism with a kind of. Uh, I mean, it's hard to situate Hasidism, uh, not only because it's of its diversity, but also because its idiosyncrasy is in any sort of neat, like right versus left binary. But I think it's it, it's common to associate Hasidism with a kind of conservatism and neo-Hasidism with a kind of like leftist bent. But you're reminding us that um, that's even not, even on the neo-Hasidic side, that that's not necessarily the case. It's not like if you somehow take Hasidism and combine it with with a relatively secular non-Hasidic sphere that you're necessarily going to end up with some sort of crunchy new agey spirituality. You could also end up with settler colonialism um, infused with a kind of mysticism. And I think that's something that a lot of us <laughs> are grappling with. There's a huge discourse happening in the world of psychedelic studies in a, in a similar way where people have literally contended with like this kind of pseudoscientific evidence that like somehow psychedelic experiences will make will 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 um, lead to certain kind of like progressive leftist political stances and of course one only has to look at some of the costumed members of the january 6 insurrection to know that that is hardly the case and mm. um, we have to be humble and, and careful with, with these sources that we're working with um, and, and talk about these complexities. Yeah, I, I certainly definitely agree with you. I think for me, what's interesting in this, you know, this turn from Hasidism to Neo-Hasidism, um, where the Neo comes in, is that it, it, it amounts to the people who are, who are referring to the text. I mean, you have the text, but you have the people, you have the social side of it, the human side of it, and different people, you know, it's interpretation, like this, this shifting of the, of the, you know, bring the baby with the water or leaving the baby. So I think each, each person recognizes a different baby, right? Or each group has their own baby they want to take out of the, <laughs> um, out of the bath with them and throw out the rest of the water. And so you have, you know, countercultural American people, not even countercultural, I mean, it's not, not that countercultural anymore. But I think one of the things for me that were interesting when I started doing this comparison between Jewish renewal in Israel and Jewish renewal in, in the States is that one of the things that was missing in Israel was a, was the emphasis on, on gender and egalitarian. So it's very important for Jewish renewal in, in, in North America. And for somehow, for some reason, which I can suggest the reason, it wasn't that important for, for Israelis, right? So there's some, there's some, it's more, and it's partially cultural inter, uh, you know, translation from, from the States to from North America to Israel. It's also, you know, related to other things that are going on in the context. And when, when, you know, settlers, even in the West Bank, it's not, it's not all, it's not all the same. I mean, you have those, you know, very violent hilltop youth, which who are doing terrible things. <laughs> recently, um, and you have other settlers in Yon who are very new Hasidic and students of Hasidic. We're missing a lot of your sound. 
Rachel, is, this sounds like you're, there's something like squeaking or something. Yeah, 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 I'm playing with it, sorry. Um, hmm. I'm saying that even when we look at neo-Hasidism in the West Bank, we can see different things going on among different groups. So you have those more violent or violent hilltop youth um, who are um, students of, of Rabbi Ginsburg from Itzhar. And you have um, students of Rab Fulman from Gush Etzion who are trying to sort of do so, sort of peaceful dialogue with their Palestinian neighbors um, while being settlers in the West Bank. So, you know, the context is almost everything for me as an anthropologist. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of what we're talking about is, I really liked what you said where the baby, everyone has a different baby. And, and I thought that in, in social vision, something that um, uh, the reading of the Baal Shem Tov's letter of his Rosh Hashanah, Ascent to Heaven, um, which is um, early on in the book and, and Wexler outlays, outlines, sorry, um, eight or nine like uh, tenets of the Hasidic ethos, which I, I, I wanna hear uh, maybe as, a, as we only have nine minutes left, so maybe as a way of closing how these, these are, the whole book is kind of based around these eight ideas, which is right, one reading of the text. And I, and I would love to hear how these ideas either do or do not um, play out in your personal work. Cause also have three people coming from different, I think all three of the presenters today are bringing different babies to the, to the panel. Um, so the three, just really quickly, the, or sorry, the, the eight, uh, what, what Phil calls the characteristics of the Hasidic ethos um, are the, the social aspect of, the, of mysticism, that it's fundamentally joyful, um, that, that the, the, right, what Sam was talking about, this embodied soul has cosmic significance. Um, it celebrates the possibility of self-transformation and even reconciling, uh, and even reconciliation for evildoers. Um, this is something, Rachel, that you just mentioned and, and that I would love to hear you speak to that uh, number five is an, e e sorry, an egalitarian impulse is central to its aspirations. Um, six is, uh, uh, sorry, I can't find six. Seven is the phenomenological emphasis on effacement, right, of, of Bittel, of, of self uh, denial to the world. And then eight is that wealth is belonging to all of um, Israel, all of people rather than to individuals. So these eight, obviously this is one reading of, of that very um, central, right? That's like the thesis statement of Hasidism is this, is this letter. And so I'd love to hear what, how that hits you and how it shows up or doesn't show up in your particular work. <laughs> Well, almost, almost all of those show up in the work of healing. I mean, healing is a process of teshuva, of transforming the pain of the past and carrying that energy forward. It's about restoring joy. Um, Beetle is a very important aspect of knowing our place in the scheme of things. And it's relevant both to me as a healer, but also to my clients. It's my own ability to make myself small that gives space for others to open up. But when we, people tend to either feel like they are greater than they are or that they are worthless. Very few people have a healthy sense of balanced narcissism. What um, the Chiska Rebbe with his, you know, two kvittel in each of the pockets, one, I am dust and ashes, I'm nothing. And one, the entire world was created for me. So helping people both own that they are a one of a kind, unique, um, chip off the divine block or what the Ishbitzer calls a piece of the divine mosaic, a piece of God's face to know that we're inestimably important and one of a kind. And at the same time, we're nobody. We're not separate. We're part of an interconnected whole. And that's 
you know, the, the principle of Yehud, you know, for the community, for the collective, but also internally unifying the self um, within as well as interpersonally. I think from my, my view, thinking about young people engaged in, in, in neo-Hasidism, these Israelis I, I, I meet here, um, I think the point of joy is very important. I think that's part of the, um, especially for people who all come from Orthodox background, who are very frustrated and very critical of, of the way they feel, you know, religious practice is, is, is practice in, you know, like your ordinary, ordinary shul. Um, and then, and the idea of joy and motion and music and all this, you know, this sen sensory essence that can come into play in spiritual experience is very important for them. And it's, it's, and it's not, and I think that's why when you see all those um, Kabbalah Shabbat and so it's always with music. There's also a lot of music and sometimes even dancing and there's a lot of about it going on right now. So that, I'd say that's one aspect. And the second aspect is self-transformation. But I mean, at least at least those people I've, I've met in the field, self-transformation was kind of narcissistic project. You know, how do I not, it's, it's kind of, I'd like, to, I'd like to feel something. I'd like to transform myself. I'm looking for a, um, and transformative experience, which is never clear exactly how they want to transform myself, but it's certainly about myself. So I, I think it is, I mean, I'm not sure if these things balance each other, but definitely those two, these two dimensions exist in, in, exist in Israel, in, you know, in Israel. I'll just add to that. Um, I say a word, it's, um, it's, it's, the the process of trying to essentialize anything is is illuminating <laughs> and it's always going to be limited it uh limited it it reminds me of um there's the story where uh, after Moshe of Kobrin dies the Kutzka Rebbe asks one of the one of Moshe of Kobrin's Hasidim you know what was the ikar of of your of your Rebbe's teaching and the response is whatever was happening at that moment <laughs> that was the ikar for him you know like kind of refusing to essentialize the the wisdom of his teacher and i um you know we and we could look at this psychologically also like if i were to try to boil down even as one individual person you know like what is who am i <laughs> like what are the pillars that that constitute my personality my identity I will I will inevitably be distorting the wholeness that 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 you were speaking about as Estelle the which is always messy and <laughs> complicated and and a coincidence of opposites paradoxical um so I you know this is this is where like the historian in me kicks in. This is partly what I love about the academic approach to the study of religion is that I can say, you know, I study people who essentialize <laughs> and, and try to describe as thickly and descript and deep and detail orientedly as I can those discourses. So to boil Hasidism, which is an extraordinarily diverse, complex, ever-changing, dynamic conglomeration of movements, which are themselves conglomerations of individuals who are each complicated, you know, I'm, I'm very intrigued with this, with those eight, um, those eight points to kind of distill Hasidism down to something. And um, if I were to do that, uh, it would also be a distortion of, of Hasidism, an, an illuminating distortion of Hasidism, which would say as much about that movement I'm talking about as me. Um, and I think we have to do that. There's a sort of audacity there that keeps us honest. Um, we don't want to just be, uh, you know, there's a time to complicate and there's a time to, um, to distill, but...
Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. We just we reached the end of our hour. So I'm just going to thank all three of our panelists who all did such a great job. And thanks so much for joining us. And we have totally different time zones represented Hawaii, California and Israel. So either good morning or good night to, to depending on who I'm speaking to, um, or I guess middle of the day for you, Sam. Um, we have another panel in 15 minutes, so please join us back for that one. That one um, is going to be socio-mystical justice and incarceration, um, and that'll be another hour panel to, to close out our day today. And then please join us again tomorrow um, for Education Day, and then following Monday for a day closing out the conference. Again, thank you so much to our, to our panelists, and um, we'll see everyone in 15 minutes. Thank you so much to all thank of you. you. Bye-bye.